So we might begin now. Um, so welcome today. Um, sorry, welcome everyone today to our webinar, Exchange Rate Theory. Is, is, it, is it as horrifically boring as it sounds? With uh, Professor John Harvey from Texas Christian University. So firstly, I'd like to welcome all of you and uh, that I'd also like to explain what One Money Australia is for those who are new to our organization. So we are a nationwide community organization here in Australia that is looking to promote a better understanding of macroeconomics, that factual macroeconomics, and to build an awareness of a theory of known as modern monetary theory as well, which seeks to provide a better explanation of how our world works. Um, so, with today's talk, Dr. John Harvey will be exploring, Professor John Harvey, sorry, um, will be exploring the, some of the underlying assumptions in the orthodox framework about how exchange rates work and if they stand up to muster. We will have a Q&A section after today's talk where you can ask John Harvey your questions. We'd just like to ask that if you do have any questions that you can put them in the Q&A section, the bottom of the Zoom webinar function. Um, that just lets us keep track of what questions um, to answer. And so your question doesn't get lost. If you'd like to ask your question live, you can also raise your hand in the chat function um, at the end of the talk, and we will hopefully have the time to address it. Also, if you do enjoy today's talk, um, this is run by a community of volunteers. And so we'd really appreciate it. a couple of dollars if you would be generous enough to donate. And you can do that through Eventbrite at our future events if you come along to those. Um, now, so I don't ramble too long, and because you're all here to see Professor John Harvey and not me, um, I just want to summarize some of John's career, just for those of you who may not be too familiar with him either. Um, so Professor John Harvey is a professor again at uh, Texas Christian University, where he's taught since 1987. He's currently also a uh, department head there. His specialties are macroeconomics and business cycles and um, contemporary schools of thought in economics, as well as international economics with a particular focus on exchange rate theory. Um, he served on the board of um, the editorial board of the American uh, Review of Political Economy, um, as well as being the executive director of the International Confederation of Associations of Pluralism and Economics. And his research consists of over 40 refereed publications and two edited volumes and two books, the second edition of one of them, um, Contending Perspectives in Economics, a guide to contemporary schools of thought has recently been uh, published again, I believe. Um, and so with that, I won't keep um, Professor John Harvey from the stage any longer um, and I'll pass it over to him. Thank you. All right. Ah, and does the fact that my picture is now highlighted mean that I'm broadcasting to everyone. Yes. <laughs> ah, excellent, excellent. All right. So, well, thank you very much to, to, to Jane and Joe and Joshua and Dallas, especially for all the publicity and, and for inviting me and so forth. I was, however, horrified to read that people were looking forward to this because I'm not sure. Well, uh, low expectations are our friend. And I, I know this is true because my wife wanders around the house saying that to herself, and she seems fairly happy. So, I, I ask everyone to please lower your expectations because how on earth could exchange rates be that exciting? Well, I'll give it a shot. Now, we've all had horrible news. Um, gosh, I started to say just this year, but it goes back further than that, doesn't it? So I wanna share a quick, nice story, at least it's nice for me. Uh, we, for dinner tonight, decided to order out Mexican food and they got there fairly quickly with the wrong meal. So this, that, and the other, long story short, we got a free frozen margarita. So as the talk goes on tonight, so the margarita will be disappearing. Uh, either the talk will get better or worse. Uh, so we'll see, it'll be an exciting game for all of you to play along with at home. Also, by the way, even though it's the morning in Australia, I think the fact that someone is drinking that you're watching kind of opens up the game to everybody. All right, so how am I gonna make this exciting? Well, um, first of all, let me tell you, if I've written up a number of notes and so forth, and I, and I wish I wasn't going to rely on them as much as I, as I am, but um, getting ready for fall semester has been a beating. Um, and, and so I really only got done uh, 
our, our classes start on Monday. I got done yesterday getting all my classes ready. And then I wrote this right afterwards. So uh, I, I think it, I made my poor wife sit and listen to it and she made various suggestions and so forth. Uh, perhaps what I should say now is that any remaining errors are her responsibility. Okay, so enough of that. Let me go on now, if I may, to share my screen uh, in the PowerPoint that I created. Actually, first, let, I guess, let me bring it up here. Uh, and F5, and now Alt-Tab back to the screen. And now, right there. Okay, uh, Joshua, is everyone seeing exchange rates and stuff, my exciting Yes, title? they are. Excellent, excellent, all right. Okay, so um, one of the things they teach you, I believe, in PowerPoint school is to try to put as much on a single slide as possible. So that's what I tried to accomplish here, as you can see. Uh, I, uh, largely, these are notes for me, so I, I know what I was going to do next. Uh, and what, I'm going to go through sort of seven stages here in the talk. It's only going to take me about six hours to do this. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is to start off and say, well, why should I even care about exchange rates? And so say a few things about that. Then uh, the troubles that neoclassical economics have, has had in explaining exchange rates. Then a period of history they went through where they thought, well, maybe we're wrong. That's, that's number three. Then stage four, nah, we can't be wrong. Uh, and so I was, well, I, I'm sorry, I started to jump ahead. Uh, and then I'm going to give you a quick example of neoclassical exchange rate theory, because, you know, it's one thing to say uh, in, in stages, you know, two and three and so, but it'd be nice to have an example. All right. So I'm going to give you an example and then critique it as, as the specific example. And then finally, finally, we're going to have a rescue here. Uh, I started to just write the cavalry and then all of a sudden I realized, you know, for me at any rate, that image is the cavalry in the old west and they did some bad things too. Uh, so I decided to, to have everyone picture Rohan at uh, Minas Tirith instead, or even Rohan Gray, who is in fact an Australian himself. You may well know him. So here we go. Number one, why exchange rates are important and how on earth I found this cartoon, I have no idea, or, or what, what um, inspired someone to, to, to make this cartoon, I don't know, but it was perfect for me. So uh, why they're important. Okay, the Mexican financial crisis. There is the value of the peso from the end of December 94 through March, and it absolutely collapsed. Uh, notice the, the, the uh, my wife pointed this out, but the vertical axis. Uh, well, yeah, because the, the, the more pesos per dollar, the cheaper the peso is. But an absolute total collapse of the peso took place at the end of 94. And yes, it lost 60% of its value in two weeks. And unfortunately, uh, leading up to that point, one third of all new loans in Mexico were being made in foreign currency, primarily dollars. So imagine that. All of a sudden, over the course of two weeks, all your debts have gone up by 60%, independent of everything else. Of course, now there's also going to be a terrible downturn in Mexico as well, as it, as it points out on the last bulleted point. And the situation was so bad that the non-performing loans, the loans that weren't getting paid back, were double the entire value of the Mexican banking system. This was an absolute tragedy, absolute tragedy, and uh, driven primarily by the collapse of the peso. Closer to your home, the Asian financial crisis, and Thailand in particular, Thailand had been the fastest growing economy in the world. Not, you know, hey, Thailand was doing okay, or, you know, Thailand doesn't suck. No, Thailand was the fastest growing economy in the world. And then the Thai, Thai GDP fell from 170 billion to 102 billion US dollars. Uh, and and what, really, what really gets me and why I really wanted to show this is the third bulleted point there. And that is the number of Asians living in absolute poverty more than doubled in countries without elaborate social safety nets and pockets of absolute poverty reappeared in Korea and Thailand. These people had nothing to do with what happened. These people were absolutely the weakest situation, you know, position to start with. And because of essentially real estate speculation uh, in Thailand, uh, they, you know, absolute horrible suffering. I'm sure the people who actually made the investments that then caused the collapse suffered very little. But this is why exchange rates are important. Imagine that the Thai bot fell by 50%. So anything that Thailand imports after that, uh, and I'm sure there's quite a few things that they, that the, as a developing economy needed to import, is suddenly 50% more expensive. And who is this going to hit the worst? It's going to hit the poor the worst. So absolutely horrific situation. Well, now let me give you something marginally more mundane, but still, I, I hope to point out, still very important. 
these are just uh, some fluctuations in the dollar that took place around the financial crisis, uh, the dollar euro around the financial crisis and, and on into, as you can see, 2011. And look at the amount of fluctuation in the dollar. Over those first 27 months, the dollar falls by 28%. Then the next 11 months, uh, up by another 18, you know, down by 17, up by 16, down by 18. This is insane, but we've become so jaded by it. We, we, we don't even think twice about, well, yes, of course, the you know, exchange rates do this sort of thing. Well, what if those had been rates of inflation? What if in the United States from January 2006 to March 2008, the dollar, I'm sorry, the, the uh, inflation had been 28%. People would have been marching on Washington. Uh, this would have been an absolute disaster and, and, and certainly had caused a great deal more attention than this caused at the time. But of course, that is what that is. That is inflation. Everything the U.S. imports became 28% more expensive. And then over the next period became 18% less expensive and then 70% more expensive. These fluctuations are out of control. And as always, the people who are in the weakest position are the ones that can't actually you know, uh, pay the cost. Of, of what's going on. All right. So why shouldn't economists be able to figure this out? Shouldn't this be something that economists are particularly good at explaining because currency market is the largest market on the planet. It is $6.6 .6 trillion per day. So, so get this. In three days, the foreign exchange market has traded as much money as the size of the entire US GDP in a, in a year. Right, so in three days, they match the value of U.S. GDP in a year. So it's, a, it's a, by far the largest market on the planet. Well, you know, neoclassical economists or, or uh, I don't know if you're familiar with different schools of thought in economics, but mainstream economics, they're all about markets. They should be, be able to easily explain this. And I'm, I'm going to make a point here mixed in with this. I, I decided last night a sort of secondary point I wanted to make alongside the exchange rate stuff was how those of us that are in academia, what we have to deal with being in the minority, what the, what, what the mindset is of that school of thought that's in charge of all the PhD programs, uh, the, you know, grant funding, um, tenure and promotion, hiring, conferences, journals. The school of thought I'm describing here as we lead up to this is the one that's in charge of, a, oh, not to mention policy, by the way, they're also the ones in charge of policy. Uh, and so I want to touch on that a little bit as well. So let's see what we've got here next, John Harvey. Oh, yes, of course, of course. All right. Okay, so I think I'm going to turn the camera off now. Sorry, as I say, I, I only had a chance to write this yesterday, so I'm not nearly as on top of exactly where I should be as I would like to be. But I do have my very complete notes here. And yes. Oh, oh, uh, okay. So let me read to you then. I'll turn off the screen share. Is it me again? I hope so. Okay. I want to share with you neoclassical explanations of the largest market on the planet, right? Uh, neoclassicism, which is, you know, all about free markets. Uh, and as I said, in three days, the currency market is the size of the US GDP for the entire year. And this is a wonderful book that I used to assign by a fellow named um, Lawrence Copeland. It's a neoclassical book though. And I used to assign it in my exchange rate course because it's all there was uh, until I done wrote me a book too uh, on exchange rates. In fact, Stephen uh, Hale is the first time I got in touch with him. It was because he was using that uh, in class. But back before I had that book, I didn't have anything else to teach. I didn't have any other uh, you know, ideas. I did a little bit at the end, but mostly I just did neoclassical stuff. But this book is really well done. Um, it explains these incorrect models uh, very plainly and clearly and, and, and completely. And there's lots of lots of beautiful graphs and equations and so forth. Oh, look at that. Three quadrant diagram. Nice. Uh, but my favorite part about this book is that he always stops and says, how well has this worked in the real world? Which is a really gutsy thing, as you'll find out here in just a moment. So let's just turn here to the part of the book that talks about exchange rate determination. And let's find out what their theory is of how exchange rate works. Oh my gosh, they don't have one theory, they have five. It starts on this page here and then continues over here 
as they go through all the theories of how exchange rates actually work in the real world. All right, well, okay, let's see what we've got here. The first one is the flexible price model, the monetary model associated with, with Milton Friedman, that, that, that school of thought. And again, really nice explanation, lots of charts and so forth. But here at the end, the monetary model as an explanation of the facts. Unfortunately, as an explanation of the facts, the monetary model must be regarded as grossly inadequate in anything but the very long run, all right? By which by, they mean, by the way, they don't mean, you know, anything over three weeks. They mean anything like, you know, a decade. Uh, to them, the very long run is the a decade, decade. I've, I've seen studies of this particular model where they tried to check exchange rates over the course of centuries. So that for people who are elves, for example, are, are immortal. So for them, that would be a very useful exchange rate theory, but for the rest of us, it's not all that helpful. But okay, okay, okay that, that's the first exchange rate model. So surely the next one's better. And the next one's called the Mundell Fleming model. And it's got a four quadrant diagram. So it's out of a whole quadrant. So this must be better. So let's read a section here on how well it works called evidence. A quarter century after it was developed, the analysis presented in this chapter looks naive. Okay, well, that's not encouraging. Um, but it's a quarter century old. So let's go to the next chapter. All right. Again, the dominant school of thought, the one that makes policy, the one that's in charge of the PhD programs and so forth. Uh, and this is called the Dornbush model. And I'm going to bring Dornbush up again in a little bit here. So that's why I, I bother to point that out. He too has a beautiful, well, look, all kinds of equations and so forth. Here is the summary uh, of how well this model works. Nevertheless, the poor performance of the model and its derivatives in explaining the facts is undeniable. The next one's my favorite. I hope I can read it out loud to you without laughing. But the fourth school of thought, or, or I'm not, not school of thought, I'm sorry, the fourth model within the same school of thought, the portfolio balance and current account, and you know, it goes through the whole model. Again, it's a very nice book. He explains it very well. And, and But you're going to think I'm making up what I'm about to read to you uh, here in this last, where he, where he sort of sums up how well this model is done. To travel, hopefully, it is said, is better than to arrive. Um. I can't imagine being the undergraduate student who has struggled through this talk, who was I mean, through this book and through this course. It's highly technical. And you get to chapter four, right, of, of, of different schools. It, it, to travel, hopefully, it is said, is better than to arrive. What in the hell does that mean? So anyway, uh, guess what? That one doesn't work either. And there's a fourth, uh, sorry, a fifth one as well. Um, in this chapter, we've examined the model with, at its core, a demand money mechanism, which is, and then he puts this in italics, potentially very important, because we don't know. Uh, and there are a number of theoretic, none of them work, all right? None of them work. And uh, this is troubling, <laughs> to say the least. And, and I want to tell you, let's see, am I ready to go back to the, to the screen now? Because this book came out in 1989 when neoclassical economics was having a bit of an existential crisis, and as it should, but nevertheless, um, let's see here. We'll go back to this. Is that it, John? Yes, it is. All right. Alt tab. And share screen. Okay. They suffered something of an existential crisis, neoclassical economics did. And it arose from, uh-oh, I don't want to jump ahead on my, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, existential crisis. And this is when I was getting my PhD. Uh, you know, Joshua mentioned I've been at TCU since 87. This book came out in 89. And, and a lot of the things I'm about to tell you here uh, developed in the, oh, through the 80s and, and in the early 90s. And I was kind of excited about it. I was like, wow, this is, you know, because I think these models suck and they're admitting it themselves. Isn't this wonderful? And so I want to tell you about a, um, two authors. One of them is Kenneth Rogoff, who you might have run across his name when he was attacking MMT at some point. Uh, he was also the one, if you get uh, the Colbert rapport in, in uh, it's, 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 it's over now, the TV show with Stephen Colbert. Uh, he did a special episode on Kenneth Rogoff and, and, and Carmen Reinhardt's paper, 
that said that if you raise the debt too much, uh, then it, it, you know, I think it was some percentage or whatever it was that, that the economy would contract. And of course, it turns out that there were huge data errors in it, as was discovered by, oh, what's his name? He's a Facebook friend of mine. Um, he was at UMass uh, Amherst. But uh, anyway, Thomas Herndon. Uh, so you may have seen Kenneth Rogoff's name somewhere else. Well, here Kenneth Rogoff was actually doing something relatively positive, along with his co-author, uh, Richard Meese. They were young staffers at the International Finance Division of the U.S. Federal Reserve Board in Washington. And it was a brand new Fed chair, some guy named Paul Volcker, all right? Uh, and he wanted to know, uh, do we have any exchange rate models we can use to predict future exchange rate movements? Because that would be really helpful at the Fed. Find out which of our models is the best. Uh, and then we can use that model. Now, these two had access to data no one else had access to. And they were, you know, fresh out of MIT, and I can't remember where Mies went, but maybe, maybe UCL, maybe Berkeley. Um, but, you know, with these very impressive neoclassical pedigrees, uh, and they tried and tried and tried to make a model work, and nothing would work. So they wrote up a paper, and they, they wrote up a paper saying that none of our models work. And they then sent that paper out for publication. Now, I want you to see this again in the context of why it can be so depressing to not be a neoclassical economist uh, when they're the ones in charge of everything. Uh, well, not, 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 it's not depressing not to be a neoclassical economist, but it's depressing that they're the ones in charge uh, because this is what they, this is the response they received when they sent out their article to erstwhile friendly, you know, uh, publication outlets and this isn't, the red there is meant to be kind of hard to read because it's supposed to make you angry, all right? Um, this is what, th this is on uh, Rogoff's webpage. He explains what happened when they sent it out. And the American Economic Review is a, is a top neoclassical journal. And the, the, as you can see there, the editor sent back their manuscript with a scathing letter saying that the results are obviously garbage. And then if we wish to remain in the economics profession, we had better develop a more positive attitude. What the hell is that? Uh, aren't we supposed to be trying to figure out what does and doesn't work and not, you know, maintain a positive attitude? Oh, uh, as a slight aside here, um, I don't know if you're aware of the paper by Paul Romer, uh, R-O-M-E-R, that came out a few years ago, right before he won the Nobel Prize in economics. And I happened to be on a panel with him, so I was asking him about this paper. In this paper, he absolutely destroys his own school of thoughts, macro modeling. He says that today in neoclassical economics, he doesn't say neoclassical economics, he just says economics, but to him that is what economics is, uh, that today macroeconomic research doesn't even qualify as scientific, all right, is what Romer said. Now, you know what the, again, this is just from talking with him, the biggest negative he got, how dare you? How dare you say these negative things about our founders, like you know Milton Friedman and Robert Lucas? Uh, well, it wasn't. Well, I, I disagree with your results here, buddy. It was. How dare you say this? So this is. I'm sure we're all guilty of this to some extent, but I don't know. I kind of feel like if I sent an article off to the Journal of Post Keynesian Economics trashing Keynes, that would not, in and of itself, invalidate you know the, or, or, or destroy my chances of being published there. They'd read it and see what they thought. Here. It's a very depressing situation. All right. So, but they did get it published. They got it published in something called the Journal of International Economics, which is apparently a very popular neoclassical uh, you know, journal. And, and I, I just want to point out two things here in the abstract. One is where they point out in the second sentence that we find a random walk works as well. So in other words, sort of a, a, a random movement of the exchange rate. Uh, let's just say it goes up by 10 tomorrow. I don't know. That worked as well as any of their models. Uh, and the last sentence is particularly damning. The structural models perform poorly despite the fact that we base their forecasts on actual realized values of future explanatory variables. In other words, if you or I were doing a forecast right now, we would have to guess what next month's unemployment statistics are. Or what, at, 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 back up, John. We would have to guess what unemployment is right now because we don't know what it is right now because we won't know until the data are collected. They didn't do that. They went ahead and put in the right number. They went ahead and put in the actual values, things that people wouldn't even have known then, uh, but would nevertheless be relevant, and it still wouldn't work. So, as I say, existential crisis that, and, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm kind of excited about this. 
because uh, I'm thinking, well, maybe there's a place for John Harvey. I don't want to be in the school of thought that gets picked on or actually ignored. I'd love to be in the school of thought that gets, you know, grant money and, and uh, uh, maybe a shot at the Nobel Prize, you know, stuff like that. But uh, so I thought, well, maybe here's a chance for, for uh, an ordinary guy like me. And here is, uh, by the way, this is sort of a summary here of in 95, what neoclassical economists were saying about their own, I put this in blue as a happier color, um, but uh, saying about their own exchange rate theory. And as he says there, uh, there seems to be little professional disagreement that is a guide to short run behavior. And by short run, he doesn't mean weeks. He means years. All right. Uh, th this doesn't mean, you know, well, yeah, we can't tell what's going to happen over the next 10 minutes. They're saying we can't tell what's going to happen over the next year. Um, of the major exchange rates, exchange rate models based on macro fundamentals. And by that, um, I have a whole article I wrote years ago on what do neoclassicals mean by the word fundamentals? Because the thing is, one person means one thing and one person means another. But essentially, it's the stuff they think ought to be driving the exchange rate, the things that are that, that a reasonable person would expect to run the exchange rate. And he said, it doesn't work. It, it, it's failed. And, and, and as I say, I was thinking to myself that, you know, well, this is fantastic. Uh, maybe we're going to end up with a discipline where, you know, there are papers talking about uh, exchange rates being moved by psychological forces. Uh, and uh, if you're into Keynes's economics, uh, in an environment of uncertainty uh, and, and so on, uh, that, that, you know, that's a place where I could publish something, where I could, I could be interested and fired up about it. And indeed, get this too. I, I, I forgot to mention this. After that Mies and Rogoff paper came out, there was an avalanche of papers about how, hey, I tested a model and it didn't work. Well, no kidding. There's like an infinite number of things that don't work, all right? So, so normally you can't get a publication testing something that doesn't work. Normally it has to be something that does work. But what they were doing, with, doing was they were testing all of their own models and they were coming up with the same results that Mies and Rogoff did. And for a while there, this was very popular and it was accepted because this article had come out. Uh, and again, it, it was very widespread that they were saying that, that our models don't work, all right? And, and again, I was very excited because I was thinking this might be an opportunity for those of us who lean more towards the, the Keynes uh, direction. Well, uh, it, it didn't. All right. So that's not that's not what happened. Um, it was very disappointing uh, it, to, to cut a long story short, which is also a song by Spandau Ballet. Uh, my wife and I do karaoke every Friday night, and I just sang that last night. Uh, perhaps if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that. But to cut a long story short, they decided that, you know what? Uh, well, here, read the second one first. Again, in red, because it should be horrifying. These are the conclusions of these neoclassical economists after a decade plus of studies by themselves, not by us detractors, by themselves, showing their models didn't work, that if expectations are driven by charts, uh, then economists clearly have little, if anything, to contribute in the short run. In other words, economics can't explain what happens in exchange markets over the course of months and sometimes years. We have nothing to say about that. We should instead concentrate on developing models that can explain the long run, by which he's going to mean years and decades. Uh, and now, I have a tough time believing that the currency market is not economics over any time horizon. Because by my way of thinking, we're deciding what is and isn't economics by the subject matter, not by whether or not our tools work for that. Um, one of the things that, that's very popular in neoclassical economics is just to find, let's, let's see if this tool that we've developed here uh, can apply to how many fish you can catch, you know, uh, on, on Lake so-and-so. Uh, and you think, oh, that has nothing to do with anything important. Uh, but, hey, it's an interesting puzzle. It, it's, it's as if neoclassical economics is a carpenter with a saw in anything that a saw can't do. Well, well, that's not carpentry. Uh, well, yeah, I, I need this desk built. Well, you're going to need nails and stuff, and that's not carpentry. Carpentry is only when you cut stuff. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the way I, I, I view this. Uh, he's saying, look, since we can't explain it with our existing tools, then we have nothing to say. Well, you could change the tools. That would be one thing you could do is use a different set of tools. And the first one, <laughs> uh, the first one there, Hans Visser, had this quote in, in a paper where he says, um, He's entertaining the possibility that exchange rates might be 
over significant periods of time, months, uh, you know, months at a time, driven by psychological factors, driven by, by bandwagon effects, driven by you know, technical analysis. And he says, oh, but I don't want to think that. Because then we're back with Keynes's gloomy view. He literally says, we're back with Keynes's gloomy view. Uh, like, you know, I don't want to think that. Uh, and so that would be sad if there was no Father Christmas. So, so let's just not pretend that that's not, not possible. Okay, so uh, I had, this was in the early days of email. And I was about to go to class and I checked my email and I had an email from a guy named H. Visser. And I thought, oh my God, he's tracked me down. Um, Cause I'd been using this quote everywhere <laughs> to say what a bad thing this was to do. Uh, and I, I didn't even read it. I went to class. Uh, and then I came back from class and read the email. Turns out he's a really nice man. Uh, he said, you know, well, he says, if I am a neoclassical, I'm a reluctant one. Uh, I was like, well, okay, you are though. Uh, but, but yeah, very nice man. I was, I was very, very pleased that uh, uh, first of all, that he was all the way over in the Netherlands. So he couldn't reach me. And second, that uh, he was uh, very pleasant. Okay. So no, they did not take this period in the eighties and nineties of when they are testing their own models and over and over and over saying themselves, this doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. They, they, they also tested um, things like, are our agents' expectations rational by a, very, by, by a very narrow definition of rationality? And they kept coming up with no. Uh, and, so always, and, and, and yet, in the end, what they decided to do was, well, let's just ignore the period over which our models don't work. And by the way, don't forget, there isn't a model here. There's a bunch of different ones. So it's not, even, it's not even as if they have one model like they do in trade theory. In trade theory, they've got one model. It's not right, but they have one model at least. So uh, here they've got a bunch of different ones, but they're going to ignore the short run because none of those models can explain it. And so, yeah, the, oh, up, up, up. I didn't realize where I was. I'm going to save that for a bit. Um, and so this, this was very depressing to me. They, they, they just sort of backed out of the whole thing. Now, so, so this then is my conception of what neoclassical exchange rate theory is like. And perhaps we can expand this to, to, to the you know, general uh, approach that they take. There's going to be a second. There's going to be a second uh, panel or set of panels here, but uh, you may have seen this one already. It's it's a really good one. And then we have, and and that's neoclassical exchange rate theory right there. Uh, it didn't work, and it didn't work, and it didn't work, and it didn't work. But boy, that's an appealing theory, though, isn't it? So let's keep on teaching it in class. Um, you know, one may wonder why some of us got our PhDs at all. Uh, I was really depressed in my, let me back out of this for just a second. Uh, I was really depressed in my first year in the graduate program. I was at University of Tennessee, which back then was a hotbed of institutionalism and post-Keynesian economics. The Journal of Economic Issues was headquartered there, which is the Institutionalist Journal, and the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics was headquartered there. Uh, and so, and yet, most of the core theory classes were taught by neoclassicals. A and I can remember in macro, which is what I really loved, thinking, this is it? I, I thought what we were going to do is, I thought we were going to pull off all those assumptions we put on as undergrads, you know, that, you know, well, we put that on there to make it simple so you can understand it. We would pull those off. Instead, we did the same restrictive assumptions, or worse, but in calculus now, not just in algebra anymore. Uh, so I'll never forget my international trade theory class was nothing but inverting matrices and multiplying, you know, vectors and this sort of thing. Uh, and I made the highest grade in the class. I was very proud. It was nothing but math. Uh, and then I remember standing in line at the grocery store not too long afterwards. And I suddenly thought to myself, if everyone else in line knew I just finished a PhD level course in uh, international trade, they would, I would not be able to answer a single question they would logically have. Who do we trade with? Canada, they're kind of close. I'll bet we trade with Canada a lot. Uh, you know, what, what goods do we export? I do know that one. It's either X or Y, because on every exam, you had to figure that out, which one it was. And that's all I knew. And yet I made the highest grade in the class. And I could have made a, a nice career out of being a neoclassical trade theorist by just playing with math. And I liked math. I was originally, my first major was physics, but I, the physics had something to do with the world. Uh, that was important. And so let, let me, let's see where I'm up to here, John. Okay, I'm on the next page here. Haven't had any of my margaritas, so that, that's a negative. Oh, good. Okay, that's next. All right. Uh, not the margarita. 
so uh, let me, I, I did skip over something I wanted to mention to you, and actually it works quite well right here. And that is, okay, so one of the parallel things I wanted to explain in this was kind of the thinking that we're up against, um, that, 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 you know, m myself, uh, all of us who are in academia, the kind of thinking we're up against is what I just explained to you. And it's depressing because they're in charge of everything. And we're getting squeezed out more and more and more, which is why it is so wonderful and invigorating for all of us to have people like you listening and understanding and acting on these things and trying to get action because it has been so depressing. Um, one of my last experiences in graduate school was uh, that there was going to be a lunch with several key figures in uh, post-Keynesian and institutionalist economics. And they asked a couple of us graduate students if we wanted to go. I was like, yeah. So I sat there very quietly, terrified the whole time. It was Paul Davidson, uh, Alfred Eichner, uh, Ann Mayhew, Terry Neal. And very soon the conversation amongst them turned to, remember back when we thought we could make a difference and we didn't. And I'm just starting out at this point. Like, well, that's great. That's just great. Check, please. Um, so, uh, but now there is. Now this is th th this this kind of stuff right here really makes it worth going back in and and putting up with. My department's pretty good, but there's still a sense that there are people who look down on you, and it's it, it's ironic because they're doing the stuff I just explained to you. Uh, but it's depressing, and, and and so it's very very helpful. So and I just I wanted to say what a unique period of history this is to have so many people pushing on these economic ideas. And, and, and in that sense, aside from COVID-19, global climate change, the rise of nationalist, fascist, and racist movements around the globe and Donald Trump, it's a wonderful time to be alive. So, all right. So I've given you some background there on the fact that when they couldn't make it work, they decided to simply, uh, you know, well, let's just ignore that instead. Well, let me give you an example though. Uh, it might be helpful to see an actual example of a neoclassical exchange rate theory. And this is the one you're most certainly, most likely to learn in class. So let me bring this up, where am I? Yeah, right there. Um, okay. Yeah, here's your example of neoclassical foreign exchange rate theory, because I wanted to give you something concrete here as well to kind of see, well, what the hell are they doing? You know, what is it that's, what is it they're doing wrong? And is there a theme? And indeed there is, is there a theme to what's, you know, what's not working. And of course, there's the very famous Brisbane to Melbourne bread market. Uh, I know it's an 18 hour drive, but I know a lot of people keep a close eye on these prices right here. Uh, the price of bread in Brisbane and the price of bread in, in Melbourne. Um, and I'm gonna build this into an exchange rate example here in just a second. But so here's a common economic argument. And, and there's certainly some, you know, uh, I started to say truth to it. Um, one could certainly support this with some evidence, all right? So, uh, assuming that you all, like us Texans, don't mind driving 18 hours, because we have to do that, gosh, just to take our kids to school, um, that eventually people will be buying, buying, buying bread in Brisbane, which is alliterative, and they'll be selling it in Melbourne, which is gonna drive up the price of bread in Brisbane and drive down the price of bread in Melbourne, and how much? Well, if there's zero transportation costs and zero transactions costs, which of course there's not, but let's, let's do that, eventually they'll be equal, right? So you know, we start with just the basic idea that if we have the identical product in two places, then people will buy it where it's cheap and sell it where it's expensive. And eventually that drives the prices together, right? Well, let's do that for Brisbane and Shanghai, another very, very famous bread uh, exchange market. Um, and this time, of course, we're gonna have to bring exchange rates into it. Uh, and oh, by the way, I, I actually looked up numbers <laughs> on how much is the price of bread, in, uh, or a loaf of bread in Shanghai? Apparently it's about 10 yuan, uh, so I'm sorry I'm off by a bit, but uh, I, I needed to alter the number a bit to make the example work. Uh, well, make the math simpler. All right, so let's say that this is the price of bread in Brisbane, and this is the price of bread in Shanghai, and that's our current exchange rate, all right? There's one Australian dollar for five uh, Chinese yuan. Well, now, of course, we need to, to translate these prices, right? Uh, and so let's translate them both into dollars, first of all, and of course the Brisbane price stays the same, uh, but then we divide the Shanghai price by five and that turns out to be uh, $2.40. So aha, 
Turns out the bread's cheaper in Shanghai. And of course, we can do that in Yuan as well. And we'll still discover the same thing, but in a different currency, that the bread is cheaper in Shanghai. So argue neoclassicals. This, this is purchasing power parity, by the way, is the name of the theory, or, or what I'm giving you actually is the law of one price. The idea that barring transportation and um, uh, transaction costs, that the price of the identical product in different countries will be driven to equality. And so here we're gonna have a situation where the, do I have that in the wrong spot? Oh no, here it comes. Ta-da, yeah, I have it in the right spot. Um, that, uh, but initially though, while the Chinese bread is cheaper, Australia's gonna have a trade deficit. And from what I understand, that is a bit of a worry in your country over, uh, that's kind of a thing over here too, uh, having a trade deficit to China. So initially here, we have a trade deficit to China, but everyone's gonna buy up the bread in Shanghai, which is gonna make it more expensive there and sell it in Brisbane. Now, I could alter the own prices, which means I could alter the Brisbane $3 and make it, you know, two ninety nine, two ninety eight, and so forth. Uh, as um, you know, as we dump bread there from from Shanghai. But I'm only going to move the exchange rate. Why? Because this talk is about exchange rates. So one could certainly make the argument that the own price of bread, just as it did in Melbourne, the own prices of bread, the, the Australian dollar prices of bread adjusted here. I'm going to leave the Australian dollar and yuan prices alone because I want to highlight the exchange rate story. Because here's what you're gonna to be told about the exchange rate story. Everyone's gonna be buying up the uh, yuan in order to buy the bread in Shanghai. No one wants the Australian dollar to buy bread. So therefore there is an excess demand. When we have this trade deficit to Australia, again, this is a neoclassical explanation here. And one that several of those other models I showed you is actually based on, um, but, uh, when the Australian trade deficit is also evidence of an excess demand for the yuan. Everyone's trying to buy that to buy all that great cheap Chinese stuff that's identical uh, because we are assuming it's the identical loaf of bread. Uh, and so eventually what happens is, back up here and watch the top left, uh, $1 equals five yuan, now it's four. All right, so, and when we go to four, I haven't, I haven't changed the other columns yet. I haven't changed both in dollars or both in yuan yet, but backing up again, with all this extra demand for the Chinese currency because their bread is so much cheaper, then the yuan gets bid up. Uh, it used to be that one Australian dollar could get you five yuan, but now it's just four, which means that, you want, that the yuan is more valuable than it was before. And I picked out the numbers, so it would work out nice and neat like this. That turns out to be exactly $3 if we're gonna measure it in Australian dollars or exactly 12 yuan if we're gonna do it in uh, yuan. And the glorious thing is, yay, exchange rates fixed everything. This is fantastic. All right, so again, this is a core neoclassical view of how exchange rates work. So you want to know what they're doing wrong? All right, well, let's start off with what they're doing. And that's that. And they've got this idea that the exchange rates, in fact, I've, I looked for this quote and I couldn't find it, but I, I have a, a neoclassical article somewhere laying around that says something about, the only long run equilibrium point for the exchange rate is the one that generates balanced trade, which is this right here. So uh, Australia's problems are, are, are over. Now, what was wrong with that just now? What did I do just now with that explanation? And isn't that an, isn't that an intuitively appealing explanation? Uh, it's easy to grasp. As a student, you're kind of excited about it, particularly as a white male student, apparently, because economics is dominated by white males. Uh, I suspect because economics often says, hey, what you earn is what you deserve. Uh, and so as a non-white, non-male, I'm done with economics. But, you know, a really appealing argument, quite simple. Uh, and you feel like you've learned something unique here, right? Uh, and, but what was wrong with that? Well, first of all, let's, let's look back at those fluctuations in the dollar. Wow, the cost of yeast must be bouncing all over the place. Or, you know, be a little bit more realistic. Is this as a result of the changes in the prices of goods and services in the two countries? I mean, over this period, it, Europe and the U.S. had practically no inflation whatsoever. Certainly not a differential of inflation that would explain a 28% decline in the value of the dollar. Now, had American goods and services become 28% more, more expensive, 
then that could have led to a 28% dollar depreciation if purchasing power parity holds. So in order to explain those fluctuations on the right, you have to do so in the, uh, by assuming that the prices of goods and services that are traded fluctuated by the same amount. And they didn't. We know they didn't. And again, the neoclassicals say, well, yeah, we know. Uh, oh, 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 I have another quote from the book. Uh, in an earlier chapter, he goes over this very theory. And let me stop this for just a moment. I always feel like I'm doing a, 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 a kid's show. Is everyone seated? Very good. Let's see. Purchasing power parity, a look at the facts. Roger the Hedgehog. Oh, no, wait, that's the wrong book. Um, in the short run, deviations from purchasing power parity are so frequent as to be more or less the norm. <laughs> all right. So in short run, remember, it can be like months and years, all right? So in the short run, yeah, it doesn't hold. Number two, there is not even much of a tent. And this is from a guy who's in favor of it, who put a long section in his book explaining it. There is not even much of a sign of a tendency towards purchasing power parity in the long run. So not only is it not working in the short run, it's not really working in the long run either, by the way. And in terms of volatil uh, volatility, it is unquestionably true that exchange rates have varied far more than prices, which is precisely what I just explained to you a moment, a moment ago. Um, purchasing power parity predicts, the literature, that the currencies will fluctuate only as much as the underlying prices. And then here's his final conclusion. We have seen there are persuasive reasons for supposing that, in principle is at least, purchasing power parity ought to be a reasonable approximation. Unfortunately, the facts would appear to indicate otherwise. Now, let me reread that. The opening sentence. We have seen that there are persuasive reasons for supposing that purchasing power parity ought to work. But it doesn't. Oh, well. Well, here, you know, there's a test on it now. I hope you've studied it. Uh, can you imagine a physics book, all right, going through and saying, you know, I will get this theory of how electricity works, and it's just a beautiful theory. Um, and it turns out there's not much evidence for it, but it seems so appealing. Uh, and, and it comes out in this, you know, I love this book so much uh, that I, I, this isn't for the 89 edition. As I was writing this talk, I thought, I wonder if he has a new edition in 2006. So I actually ordered a new version of it because he's honest. He comes out and says, well, it didn't work. And I really like that a lot. Okay. So, um, yeah, I was going to tell you about the purchasing power parity thing and now go back to that slide. Is that right, John? What exactly was wrong with that? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, here's where we are. All right. When I last left you, Okay, so once again, I've given you a very basic neoclassical exchange rate theory, which was, by the way, in that book, it came before the chapter on exchange rates because it was so found, it was so foundational, right? Uh, and yeah, so, and you had to ask yourself, well, it, it does seem appealing. I wonder why it doesn't work. All right, I'm going to tell you. Oops. There we go. What I want to do now. And, and, and we're near the end, so if you're crying or something, that's okay. Uh, we're almost done. Um, what I want to do now is I want to ask the question, how much of the foreign exchange market is a function of people trading goods and services? How much? Remember I said earlier, okay, Australia has this trade deficit, which also means that there's an excess demand for the yuan, all right? Well, implicit in that statement was my assumption that the primary reason people were buying units of foreign currency was simply and solely to buy foreign goods and services. All right, well, let's see how much that is. So world trade in 2018 was 25.3 trillion over the course of that year. And I apologize for not getting the same year in both of these. The currency, the currency estimates are so difficult to do. You can see at the end of that sentence there, they only do them once every three years. So I could have picked 2016, uh, and I couldn't find any more recent world trade data than 2018. So, but presumably this is not going to be too far off. So that's how much world trade there was. So I wonder how much the volume of currency trade was. Was the volume of currency trade, you know, 26.3? So that 25 trillion of it was for buying foreign goods and services, and 1 trillion of it was for, say, you know, financial transactions? Or was it maybe 50 trillion to where, you know, there's twice as many foreign exchange transactions as there are 
of people buying goods and services, which could happen because the banks could make covering transactions after they loan the money for the uh, imports and exports. So let's see, let's see, is it 25 or 26 or 50? No, it's uh, one quadrillion, 650 trillion is the actual size of the world uh, uh, currency market. And but what, what did John Harvey work out here? Oh, 1.5%. World trade is 1.5% of that. So the point I'm trying to make here is purchasing power parity ignores 98.5% of, of currency transactions. It is focused in only on the 25.3 trillion that was for imports and exports. Now, to be fair, as I suggested a moment ago, there might be several covering transactions that banks undertake every time they loan someone money to buy that bread in Shanghai or something like that. They might then carry out a transaction to, you know, to hedge against that and so forth. So let, let's assume that they make four or five, maybe five such transactions. So that in fact, the amount of money that is locked up in imports and exports is five times. 25.3 trillion. That still leaves us at a number that is less than 8% of 1.65 quadrillion dollars. So at least 90% of the market is actually financial capital, which you're sitting there saying, well, of course it is. Uh, obviously, the vast majority of cross, cross you know, country currency trades are to buy financial assets and not to buy goods and services. Of course, that's 90% of the market. Well, then why does your freaking exchange rate theory look only at the part that has to do with trade? And I'll tell you why it does, all right? Because it turns out there's a reason why there. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, uh, I, I, I love this. Uh, uh, there, oh, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean to show that yet. What the hell's wrong with me? I haven't even had any of the, of the um, uh, what do you call this thing? Uh, margar margarita yet. Um, all right. Uh, but um, why would you focus on such a tiny percentage of the market when you know full well, they all know full well, they know these numbers, they, these are, and, and all of you sitting there um, socially distancing at home, you knew this. Obviously, the vast majority of this financial transactions, why would you do that? Because the other story made the trade deficits go away. Because the other story fixed everything. Because the other story said, don't worry, Australia, free up those markets and then it'll take care of itself. And this is a theme in neoclassical economics. Now, to be fair, it is a very large school of thought. Um, well, it's the largest. And so, you know, if we have a school of thought of one person, we can safely say, well, you know, old Tom over there believes X, Y, and Z, and that's what the whole school of thought believes. Well, you're right. Uh, but there is absolutely a tendency, even among your left-leaning neoclassicals, you know, the ones who are advising Biden, I assume, uh, but your left-leaning neoclassicals, to say that, well, I mean, the market is obviously the default solution. And if something else doesn't pop up, then, you know, or if something interferes with that, we might need some of that doggone government intervention. But this is not the, so, so why do you ignore all the financial capital flows? And I'm not gonna show you the big long graph that I'd make my poor students learn. But uh, when you include the financial capital flows, there is no longer any guarantee whatsoever that any exchange rates adjust automatically to make those trade deficits go away. And as I said, this is a theme in macro, they have interest rates. Uh, there's a theory that interest rates will automatically adjust to regenerate enough demand for the economy to grow in the loanable funds theory of interest. Or uh, we have unemployment. That's okay. Just let the wages fall. The wages will adjust. It'll fix everything. I can think of no other reason why they would hang on to models that they know fully well don't work other than the fact that they simply cannot, and I don't know that it's on a conscious level, but they simply cannot imagine that the market isn't the best way to solve this problem. Because when you do this their way, when you set it up with the fundamentals, uh, with, the, with the, you know, purchasing power parity with the prices in, in uh, Brisbane and um, Shanghai, then, oh, it's wonderful. The, the market takes care of everything. And, and uh, you know, then China specializes in what they're best at and Australia specializes in what they're best at and, um, and so on. Uh, I can't imagine why you would keep models you know you don't that don't work other than you just can't make yourself think that that's not the way it works. Um, and I, I can't help but show that again. It's what, exactly what it makes me think of that, you know, well, but it's a good theory. So why would you just toss out the theory? Well, because uh, you keep finding it doesn't work. All right. Gosh, so when you're the end, I said I said we were. Was I lying? No, I wasn't. Okay. All right, so.
Now, well, but that isn't the only theory that's out there, right? Hey, that, that was filmed just across uh, the way from you guys, right? Um, oh my God, did you read the story today? Of, uh, I think it was in New South Wales, the fellow that saved his wife from a shark attack by jumping on the shark and punching it. Uh, and apparently she's, she's, you know, badly injured, but very exciting story there. Uh, all Australians should stand up proud after that story. Now, let's see. Uh, there are theories that don't start with the assumption that it's just trade flows. And I'm not going to make you look at these in any detail, but I'm just trying to tell you that, that those of us coming from, you know, the post-Keynesian, the institutionalist, the um, uh, uh, MMT approach are, are not just criticizing. We've got our own models, right? It's not like, well, your model sucks. Well, okay, that's easy to say. You know, anyone could do that. What if you got this better? Well, I kind of think that these things, oh, uh, the fellows on the right there are neoclassicals. That, that's kind of my idea, uh, the way I picture that. And then on the left there is your, you know, MMT, post Keynes. You could do it this way. No, 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 that's okay. Um, and so I'm just going to go through this relatively quickly. But, but um, we have exchange rate theories that start with the idea that what we're trying to understand here is the financial market, is these economic agents making forecasts about what currencies they think will appreciate, which ones they think will depreciate and so forth. And so in, in my class on exchange rates, I go through, okay, uh, the psychology of how people make decisions, because we need to understand that in order to understand things like crashes and uh, bandwagons and so on. And then we've got these psychological factors that we can, you know, work in from, I don't know if you've heard of Conrad and Tversky, some really interesting stuff there. Keynes goes through some things in the general theory that he talks about in terms of characteristics of financial markets. He was a big, uh, big financial market player, actually. And it, it, this is a, uh, something I built that's supposed to show, it's kind of like the brain of a currency dealer. What values are they looking at? What are they trying to, what are they trying to, to, to sort of sift through as they create their forecast? Uh, and we got some math and stuff too, you know? So it's not like, again, it's not like what, there isn't something else out there. They just, once I tried to send a paper to a neoclassical journal and, and I realized there was simply no point uh, in ever doing that ever again. There, there's some models of financial crises, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we're working, we're trying to get stuff out there. Okay, but, but, but I want to finish this off with this. Um, all right, so they don't want to think that the market doesn't fix everything and they're in charge of policy. So what do we get from neoclassical economic policy? Well, the reason you get stuff like this is because of the models they use. Well, perhaps the models they use are because of what they want to believe in the first place, but nevertheless, the models they use imply that, you know, free trade is going to save everyone, right? Whereas the models that we use, by the way, uh, and Eileen Grable is a fantastic economist. If you haven't come across her stuff, uh, I would highly recommend on, on developing countries and capital flows and so forth. But uh, I was looking for something that had capital controls in the title, and I, I found some of this by uh, Eileen. And um, to, to us, the first thing is we don't need all these financial capital flows flowing back and forth that, that's making money for, um, you know, the, uh, well, the 1%, let's see, in the U.S., over half of the stock market value is owned by 1%. I can't remember now, but anyway, the, the um, we don't need all that. We don't need those financial capital flows that are suddenly leaving Mexico and leaving people destitute, that are reintroducing pockets of poverty in Thailand. Uh, and so these are very different policies, right? These are very different approaches to the way that, and they come from the models. The model suggests from the post-Keynesian perspective, ooh, I see the problem. Uh, it's going to be capital. My, my students joke that if you can't figure out what else to say on Harvey's exam, say capital controls, that'll get you some points. And uh, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, why not? All right. Well, dare we hope that we can actually make some impact here. Um, I don't know. I, I, I like to think that with your help especially, that yes, the eye of Sauron will fall, all right? So, and that, that, that's, that's neoclassical economics. Uh, and I, that is the end of my notes. And I haven't had any of my margarita yet, so I shall wait here, see if there are any questions. Well, I have the free margarita. Okay, you take your time and have a good drink. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, you must be parched. So uh, we'll get started on, um, yeah, thank you. Excellent presentation. And oh. we'll, um, 
we've got about we've got six questions excellent questions i'll start off with uh, marcus champ did you want to go live with the question marcus or would you like me to answer that i mean i i think i'll just go ahead and ask it <laughs> um unless he's yeah okay he said i can go <laughs> one of the common throw away lines about M against mmt is that any government that does it will collapse the value of their currency and exchange rates will collapse and destroy the country. I'm interested in the best way to, to respond to this claim. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, that, that's a very good question. As a matter of fact, um, I was just asked today if I would contribute to a volume on MMT and I'm gonna do the, the um, exchange rate chapter. And that's exactly what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, and, but the problem is I don't think there is an easy way to explain it to the person on the street. But what I would immediately say is that that view that it will cause the currency to collapse is based on purchasing power parity. It is based first, ooh, I may use my whiteboard. Uh, hey, look, I got kind of an Australian looking hat there. Very nice. Um, actually, that was from Halloween when my wife was, uh, uh, oh, who's the woman that went out and started the chimpanzees? Jane Goodall. Isn't yeah, it? she was Jane Goodall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, okay, get rid of the other cowboy hat. And yeah, you can see that. The, um, okay, and that pen sucks, hang on. But yeah, th this is what people are saying when, when they're making that uh, statement. They're saying that none of these pens work is what they're saying. Uh, so I, I just taught a whole semester in here. Okay, maybe that's close enough. MMT leads to, uh, it's not terrible, uh, inflation, because that's the critical thing that they're talking about, which then leads to I'll just say it out loud because I can't really see that myself. Um, so it then leads to the currency depreciation, all right? Well, the inflation leading to the currency depreciation is purchasing power parity is what it is. It's saying that, yes, indeed. The, it, it, so even if it were true, and of course, the, the, the place to argue it is right here. Um, but the place to, uh, but even if it were true that modern monetary policies caused inflation, the currency market, that, that's 8% that's of the currency market. So if um, there was inflation in the U.S. and as there was in the early 80s, but U.S. interest rates are really high, uh, then everyone buys U.S. financial assets because the currency market is being driven by the desire for, for short-term capital gain, for capital assets. Now, so there, there is no legitimate link between the inflation and the foreign exchange because the purchasing power parity thing doesn't work. That, that's 10% that's of the market. But can you explain that to somebody? I don't know. Um, because I think people believe the purchasing power parity thing, uh, at, at least implicitly. But again, my argument in that chapter is going to be that even were this to be true, there is absolutely no guarantee whatsoever. I mean, my gosh. When this guy goes on and on about how it doesn't work, then yeah, when the neoclassicals say that's not true, um, then yeah, that yeah, that may be a start. Good luck. Okay. <laughs> Great, thanks. So next question is from um, Michael Chandler, and he's asking: We hear about central banks performing FX swap swaps. What purpose does this serve? Who determines the exchange rate? And who ends up consuming this foreign currency? Well, that's an easy question because I'm not really sure. Um, and so, <laughs> uh, who determines the rates? That's a good question. Okay, I, I will tell you something tangential. Uh, this is what uh, politicians do when they're not sure to, what to say. They change the subject, and also professors do it too. But there is a great concern among your average currency market participant that a very few players are driving the prices. Now, they generally don't think that central banks. They generally think it's the Citibank and uh, you know Bank of America and so forth. Um, but, uh, well, I will tell you that when, after the financial crisis, I, I do have a currency swap story. Uh, after the financial crisis, the dollar actually appreciated. In fact, that was in those data that I showed you that the dollar actually appreciated after the financial crisis quite considerably because there was a worldwide shortage of dollars because American companies were bringing all their currency back home because their financial assets were collapsing and they wanted to have dollars over here. And so uh, 
I've heard it said that there are more dollars circulating outside the U.S. than there are inside the U.S. And so the, 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 the Fed, U.S. Fed set up swap agreements with central banks around the world saying, if you run short of, of, um, of dollars, let us know and, and we'll swap you out some currency. Now, I don't know. I guess that still leaves open the question, how did they decide on the price? Um, I have no idea. Uh, I suspect they tried to make it as cheap as possible for those other banks because they were trying to stave off a uh, collapse. And at least Bernanke as a neoclassical wasn't, you know, to uh, totally insane. Um, and, uh, but yeah, the, the, the purpose is because dollars are used in other countries. I, I don't know about swaps between other nations, but dollars are used in other countries. And, and most recently the, the huge demand for the dollar after the financial crisis, ironically, uh, led to the U.S. Federal, you know, Federal Reserve setting up exchanges with all kinds of banks. I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but it's, it's, it's all I got. That's okay. A, so. All right, we'll leave it. I'm assuming that Michael was satisfied. So he um, <laughs> will go to Jeff, Jeff Epstein, who... Um, yeah. Hello, uh, Jeff. Is, yeah, he's got a question here. Uh, he's going to ask it live, so I'll switch to him live. It's very exciting. Um, so let's go. Allowed to talk. Mm. Okay, so hold on, hold on. Are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, I'm here. Yep. Hi, everybody. Hi, John. Thanks all for doing this. Um, I have I have two questions. One, I don't know if there's even an answer, but uh, outside of your book, do you have any recommended sources to to learn? You know, the reality of this stuff. And and actually, I'll ask the second one, which is, uh, is there a connection? Like, uh, can you connect? Like, you know, I have a general understanding of basic MMT. I'm not familiar with exchange mm -hmm. rates yet. Like, is there is there sort of like a a, an, a gateway to, to, you know, from what I understand to that? Like, I don't know if petrodollar is anything. I'm, I'm the reality of petrodollar, yeah. the reality of the reserve currency, like has anything to do with that, for example. Uh, let me do the second question first. Because when I was asked if I would contribute to that chapter today, I wrote back saying, I don't know where it fits in, though. So I kind of had the same question. It's like, well, where does the exchange rate fit in, though, to the MMT stuff? And I suggested exactly what you know the question had been asked earlier about, you know, well, inflation leading to exchange rate movements. And that's not really true. And so but uh, it wasn't clear to me either. And, and to some extent, it's because there isn't. Uh, th th there certainly is a discussion that needs to take place. And that discussion is about even were MMT to cause inflation, does that cause the currency to collapse? And it absolutely doesn't. Um, but um, so uh, that's where I think those two come together. Um, but I don't know of an easy you know, sort of pathway. And as far as something to read, I wouldn't read the book. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really boring. Um, the, uh, I mean, it's got lots of, it, it's the book I use for class. Uh, so, you know, it's got lots of graphs and equations. Um, I, I've written a couple of, of, of like encyclopedia entry introductions to exchange rates so if somebody wanted to email me at j.harvey at tcu. Ooh, i could write that on the board um uh, if you wanted to email me i'd be happy to send you a copy of that um j.harvey at tcu.edu um and uh but otherwise i'll tell you there's something to be said for doing research in an area where no one else is doing any because there was very little competition over the over my career of doing exchange rate stuff, uh, nobody else is really doing it. Uh, there, there's some stuff here recently from uh, Anina Carlton Bruner uh, and a couple others, but there's not really a book out there that's written not for another economist. But if you email me, I'll send you some. Okay, thanks, John and Jeff. Is that are you happy? I can. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank Anything you very else? much. Thank you. Yeah, okay. no, wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, okay. John. All right. So next question is with um, from Anne Maxwell, and she's asking, what do we say to people in Australia who don't like deficit spending because it will depreciate the currency? Also, could you explain the difference between devalue and depreciate? Oh, I can. Uh, I just, okay, so one of the reasons why I was so tired yesterday and why I drank too much last night on our karaoke night, because I was like, I'm done, finally, I'm done. But I've been sitting in this room for hours, making every video for my class for the entire semester for fall in case something goes bad. What if I get sick? Uh, 
And so uh, I just got done on one of my videos explaining the difference between uh, depreciation and devaluation and so forth. And it's actually quite simple. Um, when the government does it, it's a devaluation. When the market does it, it's a depreciation. And then when the uh, government raises the value of a currency, it's a revaluation. And when the government raises the value, I'm sorry, when the market raises the value of a currency, it's an appreciation. So appreciation and depreciation are, are market driven and revaluation and devaluation are, are uh, in a, like a fixed exchange rate system when they when they change the value of the, of the currency. And then uh, in response to the to, to the, your first question, then, yeah, it was like I was saying, it, it's kind of hard to explain to people. But in, in order for that story to be true, that a deficit then leads to inflation, because that's the unstated premise there, then leads to a, a currency depreciation. Um, well, the critical link there is the inflation of the currency depreciation. And that's not what drives exchange rates. It's, it's as I say, you know, and the wonderful thing is, and I, I, again, I'm, I'm imagining somebody sitting at a dinner party and this would be a hard sell. Uh, it would be a hard sell, but it's, it's, it's the truth. They don't believe it, or rather I should say, they explain it, but then they say, yeah, but there's like no evidence of it whatsoever that inflation actually does that. That, that, that currency prices actually do respond to goods and services prices. So uh, perhaps the best one can hope for is to walk away knowing I'm right. That's the way it really is. I haven't convinced that other person, but they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, but, you know, uh, th that's the best I can do for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Anne has a... Um another question as well. So she Anne says, I'm still struggling to understand collapse of currency rates and monetary sovereignty. To what extent does the latter offer immunity from the effects of the former? Well, the, the collapse of the currency, like in the Asian and the Mexican, was because they were holding it at a fixed rate. And um, what happened was, I'm trying not to get, I can draw a graph for this. Because, uh, like I said, I just finished all these lectures off. Uh, in fact, many of these slides were, were, were from my, my lectures. Um, what happened in Mexico, for example, what, what caused a collapse was that if, if we have a fixed exchange rate system, and why would we do that? Well, in, in order to make international business easier, you don't have to think to yourself, well, gosh, I have to even worry about they have a different currency. Well, what, what, what the EU is, the, the euro zone, they have the same currency to make business and travel easier. So let's say we have a fixed exchange rate with Mexico in the US, which is what we had. Um, Mexico was doing that unilaterally though. And so this is what the problem that, that is created. Here's where they have set the peso value. If the peso value goes too high, that's easy. Mexico buys dollars with the peso and they have as many pesos as they want. As, as you well know, they have as many pesos as they want. They can pull the value of the peso back down by using the peso to buy the dollar. But the problem is the opposite direction. When the peso begins to fall, they can only stop the peso from falling with a currency they don't print, and that is the dollar. So what happened before 94 was that uh, really the peso was overvalued. And, but there was so much money coming into the Mexican financial market, so many people buying pesos to buy real estate and so forth, that that was holding it up. And then as soon as that money left, as soon as everyone decided, and it was it was several months where people were saying, you don't like the look of it. I don't like the look of it. Uh, but you know what? It's a game. You just want to be not the last one to, to jump off the, uh, um, well, you don't want to jump off anything in a game, do you? Uh, you have musical chairs in, in Australia where you, you mm -hmm. start with five chairs and six kids and you, you teach kids uh, pain and sorrow by taking the chair away. Uh, <laughs> so, so what you do is uh, you, you just don't want to be the last one. You know what's going to happen. You just don't want to be the last one. So, um, once, and what happened was the Mexican president made, uh, he promised to not, not devalue the peso. And then he went ahead and did it anyway by a little bit. Everybody ran for the exits. All right. So this was a problem of everyone's thinking, if I'm an American and I have investments in Mexico, then it matters to me how strong the peso is. I want a strong peso. Oh, my God, the peso appears to be falling. Let's get out, which, of course, then caused the peso to fall. So you, your big collapses are almost always... Um, related to having had a fixed exchange rate system first that the country then, same thing happened with the Thai bot. They had it, they had it hooked to the dollar um, and they couldn't defend it anymore. Uh, 
As far as a flexible exchange rate system, I, I guess in a sense, maybe the Weimar Republic, um, because one of the things that, yeah, one of the things that really killed uh, the, the Reichsmark was all the speculation against, uh, against the Reichsmark, because everyone knows that they're not gonna be able to, to do these reparations, uh, that this is killing their economy. So, and they were having to come up with these big sums of, of uh, uh, and the French didn't want to be paid in Reichsmarks, want to be paid in francs, so they're having to buy francs with Reichsmarks. Uh, and so this caused, you know, th that was a big part of the inflation, which of course is something we're all very sensitive to, since everyone blames it on printing money, and that was not the case. Um, and I have no idea if in there somewhere, I accidentally answered any of your questions. Um, so uh, uh, please uh, uh, let me know. All right. So, Anne, you can comment in the chat box if you like. If I'll move on to the next question. And we have a question from um, Avis, and then after that I'll go to a comment from Stephen Hale. Um, mm -hmm. Avis is asking, um, in the early 1980s, New Zealand valued the currency against a basket of currencies. My gut tells me this was wrong, but I don't know why. Can you explain, please? You know, I'm really torn on that. Um, th th there's a, in fact, I hadn't looked at my own book in a long time uh, until I was having to do all this stuff for, for my class this summer. And, and one of the very last things in there, uh, yeah, one of the very last things is, is actually conclusions, but then also uh, fixed versus flexible exchange rates. And, and so, you know, New Zealand is, is, is tying their currency, other people's currencies. I get the idea that it makes international business easier when you can predict what the currency is going to be. Um, well, I always use the example in class that, you know, if a Texan wanted to do business in Oklahoma, not only do we have to deal with a bunch of ignorant people, because obviously people in Oklahoma are ignorant, but, but also what if they had a different currency? Then you also have to deal with that too. We don't have to deal with that, right? That's not an issue. So I understand that side of it. But then you've given up so much control of, of your own domestic policy. And I really think that these stable exchange rates can be achieved simply by controlling the capital flows, because it's the capital flows that cause them to bounce everywhere like this. If we, Keynes argued at the Bretton Woods Conference, we must control the capital flows. If this is going to work, we have to control the capital flows, and the U.S. was in charge, not the U.K., so we didn't get to do that. Uh, and as the capital flows grew, uh, then you know the, the system collapsed. So uh, my feeling on that is, it's kind of like... Hey, I know where you're coming from, New Zealand. That's a nice idea, but I'm not sure it's worth the cost of giving up the control of your monetary policy. And um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's my answer. I guess I'm on the same position as you are, um, that I can see both sides, but something makes me think, but generally speaking, let's not do it without, there's a better way to do it. Let's put it that way. There's a better way to do it. Okay. All right, thank you, Avis. Um, and I'll move on to Stephen Hale. It's, Stephen Hale has said, could you, could I say, I could, I, I say Stephen uses John's book on inter, international finance three at the University of Adelaide. Don't believe him when he says the book is boring. It is a terrific <laughs> book and a great read, very popular with students and a terrific um, frame for, uh, yeah, so, sorry, frame for the course. So. Well, uh, thank you, Stephen. And, and I will say, if, if I was the student, oh my God, it's talking about speculation and capital flows and crises and not purchasing power parity. Um, so, I mean, that part's kind of interesting and, and they do like that part, but um, yeah, I, I guess we're our, our own worst critic, uh, but thank you, Stephen. Okay. And so thank you for all your work, Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. He's um, yeah, a great guy doing yeah. heaps of great work. So, uh, we have lots of questions actually now. How are you feeling? Do you, can you keep going for a little while longer? You've got your... <laughs> I, I just have to warn you, you might have to save your breath for um, signing out with a bit of karaoke stand-up ballet. So. <laughs> I've teed up a link there. So. Oh, well, my wife was in a band, so um, I'll have to bring her in here. Uh, okay. So sing along, so... All right, yeah. all right. So we'll go to the next question. We've got actually... Still 14 questions. So I don't think we'll get to all of them today. So I'll just try and um, work through the list. Uh, next question is from Michael Chandler, who um, has said, Australia is buying F-35 fighter jets from the US. How does, Australian, how does the Australian federal government pay for these? And does it go through the Forex markets? 
I don't know. And that's something I've always wondered about. Um, because when I go over the balance of payments, you know, where, where, where we keep track of imports and exports and capital inflows and capital outflows, um, and there's a cat. I always wonder, OK, if the U.S. gives a bunch of F-16s to Israel, then, uh, you know, where do we count that? And I don't know. Uh, and I've never obviously I've never been interested enough to, to, to pursue it, but it's always made me question that. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll say this. Eventually, General Dynamics wants dollars. Uh, when they, I have friends who work, the, 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 the F-35 uh, F, uh, is made here in Fort Worth. Um, and so at, at the uh, um, General Dynamics plant, and I have friends who work there, and I've never seen them open up their wallet full of Australian dollars. Uh, so uh, I suspect at some point there has to be a, a, a transaction made uh, for foreign currency. And as far as how the Australian government pays for it, well, we all know that, don't we? Uh, that uh, you just create money. <laughs> so, and yeah, I got, by the way, this corona, the, the, the one positive of the coronavirus thing, other than the fact that I'm actually an introvert and kind of like staying inside all the time, uh, but um, is the fact that it's been so easy to explain to people, where do you think we got $3 trillion? Oh, we borrowed that from China. That's right. The place where the whole thing started. Um, <laughs> oh, we borrowed it from Europe. Yeah, no. I mean, we just made it up. And people seem to be, I used to tell the story, where do you think we got the money for World War II when the U.S. was still emerging from the Depression? Uh, but this one's much better now. So, um, and I will also say that when I used to play USNF-97, it's an air-to-air -air combat game, everybody wanted to play the, fly the F-35. F-4 versus MiG-21, that's my favorite right there. <laughs> Vietnam War. All right. Okay, so we have um, Duke is asking, was the current recession due to the market cycle or due to the storm of COVID-19 or both? That's an excellent question uh, because I have an opinion on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, have a, um, I have a blog at Forbes, uh, Forbes.com called Pragmatic Economics. And I, I used to write in there a lot. I've gotten really busy, so I haven't, but I do one a month for sure. Um, and... What I do is when the U.S. puts out the new unemployment figures on the first Friday of every month, I write a piece to coincide with that. And up to COVID-19, I was explaining that physical investment spending, you know, uh, spending to buy, uh, to build restaurants and to expand, you know, the productive capacity of factories and that had declined for three consecutive months. And only twice since 1947 had it declined for three consecutive months and not led to a recession. So I was saying, hey, we're already drifting off. So and then obviously COVID-19, you know, put an end to everything. But in, so I'm thinking it's similar to what happened in 73 with the Arab oil embargo. The economy was already slowing down. Whether or not it was going to collapse, you know, well, no, not like it did with, with, with the, the uh, oil embargo, but that certainly pushed things over the top. But it was already slowing down. So I would say in the most recent situation, I think we're about to have a recession, but we'll never know. Okay. Okay, so uh, um, I might, people who've had questions asked, I might, um, if we get time, put those to the end of the list so, so um, everyone gets a fair chance to ask a question. So I'll go to now uh, Quentin, and he's asking, where does FX money come from? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the same place as, um, you know, because so if we're trading dollars for, um, U.S. dollars for Australian dollars and the U.S. dollars originally. Well, actually, no. I'll go into that in a little bit more. Um, essentially, the same place that, you know, the domestic money comes from, and then we just trade it. But actually, there's another place that the foreign currency money comes from. And I, I recently published a horribly boring article in the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics on the fact that in post-Keynesian trade theory and post-Keynesian foreign exchange rate theory, we had some incompatibilities, they didn't fit together. There were some things being predicted in one that didn't match what happened in the other. And so I was really, I wanted to know for years, what's wrong? <laughs> and what I was overlooking was the fact that if you decided to import something from the US, then there may be an import export bank that's gonna forward you the money, but banks can also make money up out of thin air. Uh, and so as a consequence, there's suddenly money there uh, that didn't exist before. And it, it's credit money, all right? It's credit money. But, but credit money and money issued by the government, it looks identical, all right? 
uh, in your bank account. It looks exactly, you can't tell the difference. Uh, so actually the trade flows tend to generate money on their own by banks extending credit, but most of it is gonna be, you know, just where the domestic money came from in the first place. Okay, great. So um, we have a question now from Stephen uh, who asks, thanks John. And he says, thanks John and asks, how does MMT relate to the US dollar as a global currency and the necess necessity of the um, US dollar to be in international trade? And does MMT relate to the US similarly to every other country that does or used to rely on the US dollar for global trade? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, and uh, you know what? I, I think I've had enough of margarita now to actually put the hat on. Um, so <laughs> I'll do that. But uh, the it is so much easier for the U.S. to do whatever they want with their own money because I, I explained to students. Um, where's my cell phone? Here it is. People in China are happy to accept little pieces of paper for, oh, that's my wife right there. It's not actually my wife because my wife isn't a phone, but it's just a picture of my wife. Um, but um, they're happily accept this in exchange for just pieces of paper. So the fact that we have the world reserve currency is glorious, all right? Um, what if I am a small African nation? Can I follow MMT policies? Um, I don't know. I, I have... I have always wondered about that. It is, it is not, uh, you know how it is with academics, you end up with this very narrow area of, of, of focus and that's not it for me. Um, I, I've written two papers on economic development and they were so horribly depressing uh, that I never wrote any more. Um, but it's a good question I, and I don't have a solid answer. Uh, I know there are other people who have spoken to this and have said, you know, yeah, pretty much. I'll give you an anecdote. All right, so uh, General Patton, and, and this is my wargaming room, by the way. Um, here is a, a German Panther uh, here, uh, and these are all over the room. But uh, that's why I have a story about General Patton, who I actually don't like very much, but nevertheless. Uh, so when he was in command at Casablanca, after the Allies had uh, invaded North Africa in Operation Torch, he wanted some locals to help unload American ships. And so he was going to give them U.S. Army script because the U.S. Army will you know, issue fiat currency uh, to their soldiers rather than have dollars floating around. And there's several other reasons why they do that. Nobody would, would show up to work. Nobody wanted these little pieces of paper. So what Patton had to do was, oh, and by the way, you're allowed to shop at the base store. Oh, my God. Then they had so many people who wanted to you know, help unload ships. And it's the same thing, you know, this sort of MMT argument about what ultimately creates the value of a currency Almost oh, the fact that you, that's the only thing the uh, Internal Revenue Service accepts for tax payments. And so the only thing that the base store in Casablanca in 1943 would accept was U.S. Army script. And it was selling things, of course, that no one else could get. Uh, then, OK, sure, I I've made up a reason to want this currency. So perhaps there is a, something that a small African country can do in terms of I, I think the problem comes up with is this. What if your country's not self-sufficient or practically self-sufficient? What if you need foreign currency? You need foreign currency to import food. Um, and I don't know the answer. So, but, but absolutely right. It's a very, very difficult and very important question. Yeah. And um, actually, uh, we our next webinar will be with Fidel Kaboob, who does mm. talk about this quite a bit. Yeah. I'll write about this a bit, not a bit. So, yeah. And he's be, a nice person, too. Yeah, he's a great, yeah, yeah. lovely person. So um, we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. I'll um, go to a question from Adam Kaczynski. So why one hour? So let me, I think he's got an edit. Why is one hour of labor in China? Um, what? Yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to, <laughs> to oh, that's um, right. get this question right. Why one hour of labor in China buys, no, one hour of, Sorry, totally. One hour of labor in US buys three hours of labor in China and rate this rate is stable. If we accept cost pricing, this determines the prices of at least some categories of co uh, commodities. And in brackets, I believe so-called illicit financial flows are playing an equalizing role, but there is much more to it. Yeah, well, there's a couple of really good things there. Um, one, you know, could the US compete with China? Sure. 
If we allowed factories in Ohio to openly dump the waste in the Ohio River, sure. And we would allow workers to wear gasoline suits around open flames, sure. We could, you know, it could be with China. So, so obviously, the um, the fact that at least up to now, oh my God, I got to tell y'all. Okay, I, I have U.S., U.K., and Irish citizenship. I was born in London, and my granddad was Irish, so I, I claim that through him. We have been looking very seriously at Irish real estate because we want to get the hell out of here. Because, mm. And and I'm in Texas too. It, it's really Texans are nice. Of course, I'm a white male, so that helps a lot. But um, anyway, so uh, what I was going to say was we've actually tried to protect our workers at least up to now. Uh, and so you know we, we obviously get a a um, the cost of labor is much higher over here than it is over there. But but what you were saying about the the, the cost plus pricing and the, I was going to say something about that when I was showing the slides. And I don't know if this is where you were getting to or not. Uh, on the purchasing power parity example with Shanghai and Brisbane, where my cousins live, by the way. Uh, and the fact that I made the exchange rate absorb the entire difference, that's actually probably not too far off because the local prices are going to be driven by local costs. And so it's, there's probably not much room for the local price of bread in Brisbane to move too much or the local price of bread in Shanghai to move too much. Uh, so probably the exchange rates got to absorb most of the, of the difference anyway. Now, of course, the theory doesn't work, but if we're going to talk in terms of that theory, um, and I don't know if that was where you were getting at uh, or not. And gosh, th there was one more thing I was going to address there. Um, oh, heck. Uh, oh, I know. And the, the capital flows and stuff. Yeah. I mean, and even the non-illicit capital flows are the things that are offsetting the difference uh, because they're so much larger than everything else. But I think that's probably basically right. All right, just one more question, and I'll go with um, Sue Morley has asked, is John advocating for governments to control currency exchange rates? Uh, it's a very good question. No. What I want them to do is to say, if you're going to invest your money in Indonesia, if you're going to buy Indonesian financial assets, then uh, you must place a compensating deposit in the bank, in our central bank, uh, there's penalties for suddenly pulling the money out in, in, in one. These are all Eileen Grable ideas, the, the, the slide I showed from Eileen Grable. To, it would greatly reduce the international flow of capital. Um, but that's okay. We don't really need it. Uh, and if you're going to put your money in Indonesia, you better want to keep it there for some significant period of time. Actually, let me give you a, a, an easier example to follow. Um, Keynes argued in the general theory that if we made the purchase of a share of stock indissoluble like marriage, uh, only by death can you, you know, get rid of the share of stock, people would sure do a hell of a lot of research before they bought a share of stock. Because then they would think, you know, well, once I buy this, all I get is the returns. Instead, you can sell it two seconds after you bought it, and people really don't do a hell of a lot of research. Uh, people trade on the basis of psychology rather than on the basis of the underlying um, factors that you would think would be important uh, for that particular company. And he thought that was very damaging to the economy or right? domestically, that when the most important job of an economy is done by a casino, that job is likely to be ill done, he said. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that playing the stock market was basically a casino. Well, we've got the same thing internationally. So we make it difficult for someone to do what they did in Mexico. Uh, that I, I honestly, the, the way I lean is um, towards... Uh, not towards fixed or flexible exchange rates, but towards control the capital flows. <laughs> and I got to tell you, uh, so Paul Davidson's really famous guy in our school of thought. And I, uh, but, but sometimes he's hard to talk to because he doesn't get jokes and stuff. So uh, I was at a conference and uh, they made an announcement, you know, Paul Davidson will be signing these books. And, and I mean, I'm very much a Davidsonite. So, uh, and he was at Tennessee when I was there. So I went up and I was getting my book signed and I said, I'm writing the paper right now, looking at something you were you know, talking about. Uh, and, um, you know, he was he was advocating fixed exchange rates, government control of exchange rates. Uh, and I was thinking, I, I don't know if it, I think maybe it's just the capital flows. And he was like, no, it's just the exchange rates. Um, and so, oh, and that was the same time when I said, is this your first book? Which, of course, it wasn't. It was like, he was like, well, you know, it's not. So I never made a joke to him again. Um, he doesn't get humor. So 
um anyway uh, i forgot the question um because i because i'm i'm this far down now <laughs> and i believe tonight might be another karaoke night uh, so uh, but yeah no no i'm i'm in favor of controlling capital flows uh more than controlling the exchange rates themselves because i think i think the capital flows being controlled will then control the exchange rates so it kind of goes back to you saying if we want to pass an exam we just mentioned capital controls that's so, it that's yeah. it <laughs> All right, so we might end up um, end with that question, but I am going to take this opportunity while we have quite a few of our MMT community online and pay tribute to one of our um, most passionate members who passed away this week, Nguyen Van Tuan, and he mm -hmm. um, contributed significantly to um, progressing, you know, the understanding of modern monetary theory, including um, helping Fidel Kaboob translate into Vietnamese um, some of the work he's been doing. So it was quite a shock. And I just want to pass on our deep condolences to the family and friends and say um, he'll be deeply, he will be um, profoundly missed. So, um, and I think I might, I do have the, um, the karaoke <laughs> link <laughs> but we might let you see us out with that and i'll pass it back to joshua and is it spandau ballet <laughs> and spandau ballet and it's um oh, the, uh, you need to i was so drunk last night when i was singing it though <laughs> Gosh, i was no, celebrating i won't, I won't yesterday. do that to you but it's, it would be quite entertaining <laughs> <laughs> we can maybe all do that once we sign off and have there it. you go <laughs> <laughs> So Josh, I'll um, pass it back to you and thank you everyone for attending. And next, um, we do have uh, Fidel Kaboob. Uh, actually, we have one before that, which is um, a collaboration with the AUW, but I'll hand it over to Josh to let you know about those. Thank you, John, and thanks everyone. Oh, thank you. Yeah, see you. Thanks, James. Au revoir, mes amis. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thanks, John, again today for spending your Saturday evening after finishing all of your coursework, talking to all of us. Yeah. It's about Forex markets. I imagine it wasn't how you were planning on spending the day afterwards, the weekend. You never um, know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so with that, this will conclude today's webinar. Um, and again, I just want to thank you, John. I want to thank the audience for attending. Um, as Jane pointed out, our next webinar that is coming up is an event we're hosting with the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, which is on August 29th, Saturday at 2 p.m., where we will be addressing the question with Dr. Victor Quirk from the Centre of Full Employment and Equity of how do we solve the unemployment crisis in a COVID-19 world? Um, so that should be a very good talk. Um, Victor Quirk has written extensively on unemployment, um, the political elements to it, the economic elements, and we'd love to see you there. Um, with that, I think we should let John get back to his margarita and karaoke. <laughs> um, and hope everyone has a lovely time. Until next time. Thank you. Well, thank thank you all very much.